International Film Festival The Hague. Good evening and uh, first of all thank you for joining us today and thank you for participating in this festival. I would like to first uh, ask the public if they have any questions, any curiosities about the uh, films that we just watched. Uh, feel free to ask any question. Um, that, that's great that you make photos of everything uh, to uh, attain the ambacht. Yeah, on the ambacht. That's right. The craft. Yeah, not the craft. More work. Thank you. Well, I would like to start. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I have a question actually for every, uh, for both of your movies. Uh, but then I, I, I add the movie to, uh, I add a question to the last movie first. I, I was wondering, the movie is called Traces of the Future. Um, but I wondered why is it, called, why is it not called Traces uh, of the Past? Because you really like to capture what might be gone soon. Um, well, the reason why I called it that is because Herman calls his project uh, Traces of the Future. Um, I think actually Herman can explain it best why he calls it that, and that's also the reason why my film is called the same. In my uh, entire career, I had one a red thread through my uh, my work, my free work, my autonomous work as photographer, and it's always things that were from the past. We either it uh, be uh, destroyed villages or uh, uh, cultural or industrial heritage, all those kind of things um, interested me very much and I tried to make uh, projects out of that. And then when I came to Venice and I got interested in uh, the, the crafts that are there and I saw them disappear and I thought I have to be, this time I, have, I, have to, no, I can't wait till they're gone, I have to make them now, photograph them now. So they'll be the traces for the future. So now I'm, I'm, I'm photographing the traces that are still there, but they will be traces when they're all gone. And I'm afraid it's going to happen. So I want to establish that they're still there and value uh, their work, what they're doing. Is that the answer to what you, yeah? Thanks okay. very much. Anyone else would like to ask a question for any of our filmmakers? that I will. <laughs> so, going on with you, I would, ask you, I would like to ask you, um, how do you think that the time passing is affecting not only the job uh, situation in Venice, uh, but also the sense of community, both in Utrecht and also in Venice? What do you think is the consequences? Uh, the consequences is the consequences that uh, the, the autonomous population will disappear from all those cities because the, the uh, people that want to invest in those cities are usually people that just want to make profit out of it and they buy up all the real estate and that's what's happening in Venice and so you see that in Amsterdam and Utrecht and everywhere actually the cities that are interesting for tourists they, they, they buy them and they rent them out to tourists and it doesn't contribute anything to the communities that were there. They're, they're all just, just destroying everything. Maybe it sounds exaggerated, but I think that's what's happening everywhere. Well, as a person that is uh, from the same area as Venice, who was really interesting to get to know some aspects of the city and some niche jobs that I didn't even know that existed. So it was very powerful to be able to see that today. And um, how do you think, how did you come up with the comparison between Utrecht and Venice? How come did you um, choose these exact two locations? Well, maybe it's not so obvious, but it's still both cities that uh, uh, exist because of the water. Eh? So for, sure. but for me, it was also to, 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 uh, uh, not easy to, to look for all the similarities because uh, Venice is built on, on crafts. It's, it's, it, that's where it came from. When, the, when they started uh, using the islands as a location to live, they had to do everything with their hands, from the fishing boats and the way they fished, uh, the, the, the ironworks, etc. Everything had to be crafted. And uh, that is still the case actually there. Mm -hmm. 
uh, though it's uh, taken over a lot of modern uh, crafts by other uh, means. Um, and uh, in the Netherlands, you also had a lot of crafts, of course, but it's not like, not as compared, not as compact as in Venice. Everything is in a small scale, and it's a human scale, actually, mm -hmm. what I call human scale. But even the streets and everything, the bridges, you, you can go with, you can take the car and go from one side to the other real quick. Now you have to walk, you know, and there's a bridge that slows you down, and et cetera, et cetera. It's all, it's, everything is on human scale. That, I think so is so fascinating. And that used to be the same case in all the medieval cities. It's Utrecht, Amsterdam, The Hague, etc. Everything was on more on a human scale. And that's everything is going to be destroyed. It's already destroyed for a lot, but I try to see, so I hope that it, my work will and that from Suzanne uh, will uh, contribute to you know, keeping in a lot of those things still even if they're museums. <laughs> still should, uh, you can give it through to the next generation then. Thank you. Yeah, That's okay. a really powerful <laughs> okay. answer. And uh, moving on to your film, I would like to ask you, how did you come up with this historical setting? Because not only it's a special, very special historical setting, but at the same time, we see a very different uh, scenario where we have an executioner who actually feels pity towards the victim of if we can call it that, of the situation that is seen as a witch. Um, so how did you come up with this setting and how did you adapt it to a situation where an executioner feels pity towards this person that is being tortured? Okay, <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, firstly, I didn't come up with the situation. Entgen Leighton is a historical figure. This really happened. <coughs> yeah, she was the last victim of witch persecutions in the Netherlands. And if you compare that to other Western European countries, 1674 is actually quite late. The, the Age of Enlightenment was already supposed to have started by then, which was not always true for everyone, unfortunately. So uh, uh, she was, she, she, and she really died in captivity. Mm -hmm. So many of the text and stuff uh, uh, that you hear in the film is actually just yeah. from the actual court transcripts. Um, the only fictitious character in the story, the, they were, were all involved, is the executioner. Mm -hmm. um, but there was someone doing that. They just don't mention his name. Uh, so his name is actually fictitious. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if, if you read those papers, then another truth comes to the fore. Uh, because witch hunts is seldom truly about witchcraft. It's mm -hmm. actually always about disownment and stealing and robbing strong women of their place in society. And that just jumped off the page for me. And that's where the idea for this film came from. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank you all for coming and uh, joining us today. And I really enjoyed watching these movies. So thank you on a personal level, but also I think for everyone here. And uh, see you at the bar. Thank you. Thank you.